peptides are just short chains of amino acids. Um, so we use numerical prefixes to designate um, the smaller ones. So you can have a dipeptide, which is two amino acids, a tripeptide, a pentapeptide, a decapeptide. Um, if we use the prefix oligo, that's sort of an intermediate size, and they use that to refer to you know, 10 to 20. And then a polypeptide is a longer, unbranched chain of amino acids. So let's look at how amino acids can link together. They're going to be linked together by amide bonds. Since they're part of a peptide, we're going to call them peptide bonds. Um, but a peptide bond is an amide bond. What happens is we've got that reaction that we saw for the formation of amides between a carboxylic acid and an amine. Carboxylic acid plus an amine we get a condensation reaction, water molecule is, is removed, and we get this amide bond that forms. Now, carboxylic acids have an acid on one side, and an amine on the other. And so one amino acid can form an amide bond with the next amino acid. And that's what happens. So here we have amino acid 1 and amino acid 2. And now we're going to see that this is sort of the standard way of designating or drawing the structures. This is not the Fisher projection. What, the reason we do this is because it's convenient. When these bond together, we've got the carboxylic acid and the amine group forming this amide bond. And we'll end up stringing a whole bunch of these together. The R groups hang off the bottom. It's a little bit like a charm bracelet, where we have this backbone of carbons and nitrogens, and then there's these little charms hanging off of it. So this is just showing two amino acids forming a peptide bond. This is just looking at the, um, the carboxyl group and the amino group and what's going on with them. So here's the carboxyl group. And here it is as a zwitterion. So this is, as does not have its oxygen. I'm sorry, it doesn't have its hydrogen. So here's the oxygen. And this amine group is protonated, and so we're going to lose two hydrogens off of this guy and the oxygen here, and that's where the water comes in. And there's our amide bond. Any questions? This picture is showing three different amino acids in a peptide, so this would be a tripeptide. This is glycine, alanine, and serine. And here the R groups for glycine is just a hydrogen. For alanine, it's a methyl group. And for serine, it's this small alcohol group. And so this becomes a backbone. And there is one end that's going to have the amine group. And the other end is going to have the carboxyl group. This is called the C-terminal end and this is the N-terminal end. And by convention, we always write the N-terminal end on the left. So kind of like with the carbohydrates, you could draw them in lots of different ways. But so that we can see clearly what we're looking at, we choose to draw them from the same perspective all the time, and that makes them much easier to look at. So we go from the nitrogen end to the carbon end, with all the hydrogens and oxygens on top and the side chains hanging down. When we talk about an amino acid residue, we mean the um, individual amino acid within a peptide chain. So, let's see if I can circle one. So this is one amino acid residue. It's not really accurate to say that it is an amino acid anymore, right? Because it's missing its OH over here, 
and it's missing its H over here. But it's the residue. It's what's left when an amino acid forms an amide bond and becomes part of a peptide. We can abbreviate this tripeptide by uh, using the abbreviations for the three amino acids that form it. So glycine, alanine, and serine. This is gly, ala, sir. And this makes it much easier to identify what this is without writing all these long words out. So these peptides have backbones, which is a bit like the uh, carbon chains that we talked about when we were learning how to name organic compounds. We're always going to find, we always found the longest carbon chain, right? Well, when we have a peptide, we have these amino acids bonded to each other through amide bonds, and so we're always going to end up with this repeating pattern here. It's going to go C, C, N, C, C, N, C, C, N, and we'll just keep going on like that. The second carbon um, is going to have uh, an oxygen double bonded to it, and the other carbon is going to have the R group on it. So we've got this regularly repeating sequence of these amide bonds and these CH groups. So we consider these side chains to be substituents and the pattern of the side chains is going to be variable. That could be, that'll be different for different peptides, but the backbone is going to be the same. So converting an abbreviated peptide formula to a structural peptide formula. So draw the structural formula for the tripeptide, cis, ala, gly. So we need to refer to our table so that we can get the side chains right. But we can draw the backbone in and then put in the side chains. So the backbone's always going to be the same. We're going to, we're going to put the N-terminal on the terminal on the right. So over on the left, we're going to have the NH3+, and that is bonded to a carbon with a hydrogen on it. You can draw it sticking up or just uh, next to the carbon. And then, actually I'm going to draw it sticking up because I think that's a little clearer. So there's the hydrogen, and then here is the carbonyl group. Normally this would have O here, but it's going to be bonded through an amide linkage to the next. So there's one amino acid residue, and then here's the next one. We're going to have N, NH, CH, C double bond O, and then we're going to have another one. Oops, got ahead of myself. So there's three different amino acids, but they're going to form the same pattern. This part of it is always the same. So this is the C terminal. C terminal. Always on the right. The N terminal always on the left. And now to finish this, we need to put the side chains on. Any questions about the backbone? So for side chains, for cysteine, where'd you go? There it is. So CH2, SH, I should remember that one. The next one is alanine, which is just a methyl group. And then glycine is the baby, and that's just got a hydrogen. Oops, wrong carbon. That carbon's kind of full.
So if you have a structure like this and are trying to figure out what amino acids are in there, all you have to do is look at these parts that are hanging down. This one and this one. So this is cis allogly. Any questions? We, we use these abbreviations with the three-letter abbreviations to name the peptides and just string them together, but there are also IUPAC rules for naming these. And basically what we do is we take the amino acid names. So the C terminal, the last one, just keeps its full amino acid names, all the name. All of the other ones, we're going to change the ending of their name to IL and put them on in the front and just run them left to right in the same order. So if we have a tripeptide that is abbreviated this way, glu, ser, ala, glutamic acid becomes glutamyl or glutamyl, serine becomes cyril alanine. So glutamyl, cyril, alanine. And you can imagine that might get a little tedious when you get up to like 50 different amino acid residues. It could be kind of long. And that's why we use this three-letter abbreviation thing a lot. Determining IUPAC names for small peptides. So assign names to each of the following small peptides. This first one is a tripeptide. It's got three. So GLY is the abbreviation for what? Glycine. So glycine becomes glycyl. And ALA is alanine, so alanil, and LEU is leucine, alanil leucine. Glycyl alanil leucine. And you can end up with some funny looking combinations. We've got a double L in there, and we've got this YCY business, which looks kind of funny. So B, then, is a tetrapeptide, GLY, glycyl, TYR, not to be confused with TRP, is tyrosine, so tyrosyl, tyrosyl, and serine becomes cyril, serine. Glycyl, tyrosyl, cyril, serine. It's like a tongue twister. The order is important because the ends are different. In allogly, we have alanine on the nitrogen end. And in gly ala, we have alanine on the nitrogen end. These are not just reversed. They're, they are not the same molecule because the order is important. So if you have two peptides, two amino acids in a peptide, I'm sorry, you have two possibilities. We can put one first or the other first. And then as you get more and more amino acids strung together, the number of possibilities skyrockets. It actually, if you, if you have different amino acids, no repeats, the number of possible isomers is n factorial. So if you have five, it's one times two times three times four times five. It gets pretty complicated. These, the, the, these isomeric peptides have different properties, and they are definitely different molecules, and so we have to pay attention and get them in the correct order.